Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. It is good to be here with the Scottsdale Thunderbird, Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have never been here on a Saturday before. I've come to chapel many times, and of course, this whole week I was here, and I had a great time with the students. I think the students also had a, a really good time. I can tell you that when we had the topics over relationships, they were very, very, very talkative, and it was really good. Everybody was respectful, too. But it's been a really good week. I got to meet, um, to get to know some of the students a little better. We've been talking about different aspects of, of life, obviously not covering everything because there's just so much to it. But we talked about generational identities on the first day where we got to see the importance that each generation brings, and especially Gen Z, which is this generation that's in um, high school right now. And then the next day, we talked about loneliness, and we talked about the epidemic that is loneliness and how prevalent it is, and what we can do to kind of help those who are uh, struggling with loneliness. Then we talked about relationships the next few days, and we worked in groups. In fact, maybe some of you who went to academies could remember, but I don't think that through always there was like mixed seating. When I was in high school, all the guys sat on one side and all the girls sat on the other side. Maybe it was like that for you when you were in academies as well. But so we did that. So for two days, we had all the guys sit here and all the girls sit here. And it was just a really good experiment to, to do and, 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 and talk and share. So thank you to the staff and to the students for, for being patient with that. But I think a lot of you had, had a lot of fun. And so today I'm talking about Jesus as the foundation of our life and how a life cannot be fulfilled unless you have Jesus as the foundation. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this beautiful day and we thank you for the rain that has been uh, watering over the last few weeks. Lord, we ask that you also rain your Holy Spirit upon us today and that we can understand what you have, uh, what you have prepared for us, what you have ready to deliver to your people. Lord, I ask that you speak through me and that the words that I share may be your words. I thank you and ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Look at the person next to you and tell them, get ready for a word. All right, that was a good warm-up exercise. We're going to try it again. Look to the person on your other side and then say to them now, get ready for a word. Now, Look at somebody behind you. Now, if everyone looks behind you, everyone's going to miss somebody. So, like, some can look behind, some can still looking forward, okay? And then, and then do it again, okay? Are you ready? Are you ready, Eva? Okay, ready? All right, go. Turn around and do it. Say, you ready for the word? Okay. All right, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 14. And the majority of our message today is going to be over Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. So I'll give you guys a few minutes to, to flip through your digital Bibles to get there. Those of you who brought your physical Bibles, go ahead and start turning through it now. Those of you who just have your phones, that's fine. You can use that. Just don't get sidetracked with memes, okay? Matthew 14, 22, okay? And if you are there, say Amen. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and jaywalk into this one right here. It says this in verse 22. Immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to him, 
O ye of little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. All right. And the question that I want to ask here is, why does our faith fail? Think about that. Why does our faith fail? I'm sure all of you can think back at a time when your faith failed you. When you messed up on something. Perhaps you said the wrong words. Or perhaps you tripped like how Gloria did, right? Or you were ignored, or you were insulted, or you suffered, or any kind of negative thing. If that ever happened to any of you, then this message is for you. Those of you who were able to walk on water, you can go back to sleep, okay? But the rest of us who are going through things, this message is for you. Now, we've always heard that this story, Peter stopped looking at Jesus, and he sank, so you keep your eyes on Jesus, and you'll be fine. You see, if we just look at it just on a surface like that, that may be all that we can come to, but there is a lot more to it than that. Now, Peter's life was full of contradictions. I don't want you to look at Peter with judgmental eyes, because Peter represents all of us. We have contradictions too. Now, there is a game called, uh, I think it's called, guess who? I think it's what it's called. Anyway, the way the game is played is you get a card and you put a name of some famous person on the card. Usually in Christian groups, we play a name of a famous Bible character. And you write one and you put it to the forehead of the person next to you. And then that person has to guess who they are asking yes or no questions. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay. Well, if you don't, we're going to play this game right now. All right? Is everyone ready? I'm going to put a card on my forehead. I'm going to ask yes or no questions. Help me figure out who I am. Okay. Can everyone read my card? Okay. So, yes or no questions. This is how I'm going to figure out who I am. All right. Am I a character in the Bible? Yes. I'm doing good. All right. (laughs) Am I a man? What do you mean I'm not a man? What do you... you, Okay, so am I a woman? Am I in the Old Testament? Am I in the book of Genesis? Am I Eve? Yeah, so obviously I knew who it was, right? But you see, it's very easy to, like, to figure out who this is, but with Peter, it's a little bit more difficult trying to play that game because Peter was always the one who would speak first, even when it wasn't his turn. He was argumentative. He was not easy to agree with. Now remember, I'm talking about Peter. I'm not talking about you, okay? Peter was very passionate, but he also ran away when Jesus was arrested. He was also willing to stand and preach in front of thousands during Pentecost, and yet he denied Jesus three times. So Peter's life, now after he had this encounter with God, after the three years after the resurrection, his life did change. But if we're just talking in general here, his life had its ups and its downs, its contradictions, its moments like that. But Peter here represents us. Now, there is a verse in the Bible that seems to be completely at odds with today's culture. There is a message so popular in movies, especially Disney movies. You see it in in other movies. You hear it in music and TV shows. Celebrities talk about it. Books talk about it. It is this idea or this message that do whatever makes you happy. Just be you. You hear that all the time, everywhere. Now, there is a verse in the Bible that seems to be contradictory to that. It's found in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. And Jesus says to his disciples, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Are Jesus and the world saying the same things? 
That's a, that's a question for you guys to answer. Are they saying the same things? No, right? Because one says, just be you. Be who you are. And then Jesus says, deny that. So what do we, what do we listen to? Obviously, we want to listen to Jesus. But what, is that, what does it mean then to deny ourselves? Because what, am I supposed to deny my self-worth? Right? Where, where, do we dis, where do we draw the line between what does Jesus mean when he says to deny ourselves? Well, denying ourselves does not mean denying your worth or your value as a person. That's not what it means. Nor is it saying to neglect your own needs or your responsibilities. Like, don't deny to pay your mortgage, okay? Do not do that. Don't deny to pay your phone bill. Don't deny to pay your taxes, okay? You don't want to ignore the responsibilities that you have. Rather, it means that recognizing that your own desires and ambitions must be secondary to your commitment with God, right? So once we put God in the right place, then we realize, like, this is what my actual goals and ambitions are because Christ is now leading them. And then now, when you've given yourself to God, then you can say, you know what? This serving God is what brings me fulfillment, and this is how it's understood. It's to deny ourselves, put our priorities, our will secondary to what God has for us. Where the world will say, just do whatever you want. Whatever makes, as long as you're not hurting anybody else, do whatever you want. Do whatever makes you happy. There's a little bit of a, of a, of a difficulty there. Now, I'm going to ask another question here. What is the easiest thing to complain about? I can, I can, you can talk right now. You can, just, you can just yell it out. What is easy to complain about? Food? Work? Okay. Traffic. Who said traffic? Yes. Oh, my gosh. You know, I live in Tempe, and I've been driving every day there um, to the academy over here, and I think yesterday was by far the worst day of traffic, probably because I was driving during rush hour time. The rest of the times, it was like 10.30 or, like, yeah, 10.30 that I was driving over here and it wasn't too bad. But yesterday, it was during rush hour time and I saw um, on my way from my house to the school, four accidents. All right, there was so much traffic. But what else? What else is it easy to complain about? Love? Okay. Right, like, like okay. What else? Other people. Yes. It's true. It is easy to complain about other people, especially if they make you mad. How about, I, I know my AV team is going to feel this one. What about technology? What about when technology, yeah, <laughs> when technology does not work, when you're, tr what about your phone, okay? When you're hoping that you have signal to do what you need to do, and then it's not working. All right, what if you try to turn your car on in the morning and it's not working? What if you're at home, spending time there, um, watching something on one of your electronic devices, and then the power goes out, the internet goes out. The internet one is a bad one, right? It's, then you're like, what the heck is going on? And sometimes when the storms are really bad, that's when it happens. So it's easy to complain about a lot of things. But if God loves us so much, what is he doing sending the disciples into a storm. Back to Matthew 14. Back to Matthew 14. Let's look at this here. Let's look at this here. Matthew 14, 22. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. But the boat by this time was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against it. It says that Jesus immediately made them get into the boat. That doesn't seem like Jesus was suggesting they get into the boat. Like, you guys can get in the boat if you want. The verse is implying that Jesus made them get into the boat. He's like, get into that boat. Okay, Jesus, go. Get in there. I'm going to go pray by myself. You guys get in the boat. Now, Jesus knew a lot of things. Now, when he came to earth, when he took human form, his divine power he put to the back, but God the Father still revealed many things to him, and Jesus knew the storm was coming, and yet he still made the disciples go out there. 
We think that when there are difficult times in our life, it's always the devil trying to attack us. It's the devil's fault this happens. It's the devil that did this. But sometimes, sometimes, God will allow us to go into a storm. He'll let it happen, knowing full well that it's going to be difficult for us. And yet he's like, get in the boat and go. But it gets even crazier than that. Because there was another component to the story that I did not really connect before. When I first read this verse, I almost fell out of my chair because of what it said. This is found in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Let's go there. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. This is the same story now from Mark's perspective. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. I didn't make slides for you guys because I wanted you to get in the habit of looking the verses up yourselves. Amen? Amen. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. It says, And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Ready for this? He meant to pass by them. Hold on, Jesus. Let me get this straight. So you told us to get into this boat and to go out into the, into the sea here, and you knew a storm was coming, and now there is a storm, and now we're like dying here, Jesus, and yet you meant to just look at us and walk by us? Jesus, what kind of prank are you pulling right now? Okay? Like, what do you mean you meant to just walk by us? When I first read that, I, I was... I was taken back like, Jesus, what, what kind of games are you playing? In my mind, that's what I thought. I was like, what, why are you sending them to the boat, making them go into a difficult time where they're suffering, where they're in pain, where they're experiencing loss, where they're experiencing challenge, turbulence, winds against them, problems in their marriage, problems in their life, problem in their home, problem with school, problem with relationships, whatever it is, what are you doing sending me into that, knowing I'm going to experience that, and then you don't even mean to come by and save me. You just mean to come by and see me. Right? What's going on here, Jesus? Why? And look at, let's go back to uh, Matthew chapter 14. See, I thought Jesus was going to walk by. He walked on water to go and help them, but it says he meant to just pass by them. Now look, Matthew 14, 26 but when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost, and they cried out in fear, not in faith, in fear. You see, we can cry out to God in faith, and we do that often. We do that when we sing, we do that when we pray, but it, something has to happen for us to actually cry out in fear. There needs to be some kind of crisis that we are in and we are experiencing for us to cry in fear. Jesus is sometimes waiting for you to call out to his name before he comes by. Now, Jesus is so compassionate and so loving that even your cries of fear are enough to get the attention of the maker of the whole entire universe. Now, verse 27, back in Matthew, Matthew 14, 27. It says, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. So what is Jesus doing walking at? By the way, the fourth watch is around 3 a.m. So Jesus is coming by the boat at 3 a.m. First of all, I would think that at 3 a.m. is when you want to be sleeping, not be in the middle of, the, uh, middle of a body of water, in the middle of a storm. You know, you imagine the day. Imagine the, what the disciples have already been going through. It's been a tough time. They've been dealing with all kinds of crowds. No one's cleaning up after themselves, so they have to do it, right? They're like the, you know, the, the deacons after church who have to come in and stay and clean up, right? This is essentially what they've been doing before a crowd of 5,000 people, maybe more, 5,000 men, not including women and children, so it could have been easily double that. And now they go in their boat and they're hoping that it's going to be a nice, calm ride. And Jesus knows all that they've been through that day. 
and yet he still sends them out there. So Jesus came out at night at 3 a.m. in darkness, in a storm. You see, we recognize Jesus in the form of a blessing, but we don't recognize Jesus in the form of suffering. Because we're so used to thinking that when something good happens, oh, thank you, Jesus. Yet when something bad happens, you're like, why have you forgotten about me? And it's those moments that Jesus allowed to happen. He let those things happen. What's happened to the church? In 2022, millennials became the largest population group in the world. They did. Raise your hand if you're a millennial. Okay. We make up the largest, I'm a millennial too, we make up the largest population of the world as of 2022. And what is second place? Anyone know? It is Gen Z. Raise your hand if you're Gen Z. Proudly, guys. Come on, proudly. Okay. All right. Yet in many of our churches, the young adult group and the Gen Z who are young adults make up the smallest portion of the church. If you were to ask this question, now, believe me, I am not getting political here, but I, I, am, I am saying this. If you ask this question to a conservative, what happened to the church? You may get responses like, the church is too worldly, or the church has become too liberal, or the church has too much entertainment, too much worldly music. It's lost its sense of authority. And if you were to ask a liberal this question, they might say something like, because the church is outdated or the church resembles an exclusive social club, or the church operates in a way that does not impact the 21st century person. But a person who is just trying to make it, a person who is dealing with the storms of their own life, they don't need to know the big words, they don't need to know the Hebrew, the Greek, the Aramaic, they just need them some Jesus. I know your grades may not be the best right now. I know there's been times when your grades looked better. Maybe you're going through a tough time in school. Maybe you feel like your parents don't love you or your parents aren't there for you. Maybe you don't have any friends. You know, the friends you used to have, you look around and you say, where did they go? Or maybe your home is in disarray. Maybe nobody loves each other there. Maybe everybody yells at each other. Or maybe you are sick and you're slowly dying. And you just want to know if you can make it. In Matthew 14, 28, Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And this is where the foundation for our message is. Peter says, Lord, if that really is you, because it looks like a ghost. But if this is you, then command me to go out on the water. You know, that's a very weird question to ask. I'm going to break down why it is. You know, if it, was, if it was me or one of us, and we were to see that, we're going to say, Lord, if it's you, I need a job by Monday morning at 8 a.m., exactly at 8 a.m., and it needs to pay me a living wage and full benefits, and a car would be nice, too. <laughs> or what about this one? Those of you who are single, it got real quiet there. Those of you who are single, right, you're like, Lord, if that is you, then send me a woman, Lord. The first girl I see when I open my eyes, that's the girl for me. Oh, Jesus, not her. No, no, not her. Right? We want to ask these like selfish questions like, Lord, show me a sign if it's you. And Jesus said that a wicked generation seeks after a sign, but that is not what Peter did. Peter did not ask for a sign or anything to improve his conditions. He didn't say, Lord, if it's you, stop the storm, take the boat, flip it over, and let James and John fall out because they're bothering me. He didn't say any of that. What Peter did was he asked for a command. He asked Jesus to tell him what to do. That is, that is so strange. 
You know, when we're in a storm, we want to ask Jesus, Lord, stop the storm. Calm the craziness going on in my life. Just stop it right now. And yet what Peter asked was, Lord, I don't need you to stop the storm. Just help me walk through it. <sighs> Peter, hold on, Peter, okay, okay. In verse 29, he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Verse 30, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and grabbed him and he pulled him up and he said, oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? How many of you have kids right now? Raise your hand if you have little kids right now. How many of you have had little kids before, right? How many of you have watched little kids before? Raise your hand. Now, one of the things that you tell them to be cautious of is when you're making food, right? The stove is hot. And you tell them, you know, don't touch it. Has any kid ever touched the stove accidentally, right? Touched the stove while it was while it was hot, maybe when you were a kid, you did that too. You touched the stove, and it burned your hand. And you, you didn't stop and say, like, let's pretend this is the hot dish or whatever. You didn't go like this and say, this is hot. My hand's burning. I should probably move it. Yeah, let me, let me. oh, yeah, it's, it's burning. Let me move my hand. You know, you don't do that. You immediately pull your hand away. That's how I imagine Jesus immediately reached for Peter, just quickly, just went in there and grabbed Peter and pulled him out. And he says these words, O oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? There's something interesting to be said about that. Because don't you need faith the size of a mustard seed to move a mountain? And yet, that little faith isn't enough to walk on water? How is that so? How do, well, if, if faith the size of a mustard seed, which is really, really small, if that's enough to move a mountain, why isn't it enough to walk on water? It's because I think our misunderstanding of the situation here, when Jesus said, O oh, ye of little faith, he wasn't talking about the quality of his faith. He was talking about the duration of his faith. You see, when Peter first asked for that command and started walking on water, his faith was good. His faith was great. Even if it was the size of a mustard seed, it was enough to walk. But then as soon as he took his eyes off Jesus, he took his focus, his attention, and who he was serving, he took that out of the way, and then his faith was no more, and that's when he started to sink. In other words, it's like you had faith, but you let it run out. You already have what you needed. Like all you had to do was just look at Jesus, to focus on him, to build that relationship with him. And it's when we ignore that, when Peter took his eyes off it, that's when he began to sink. Jesus is the living water, and in that water you will not sink in. If you don't think Jesus can use you, let me remind you of a few things. Now, I saw this online, and I'm going to use this here. If you don't think God can use you, let me remind you that Noah was a drunk, that Abraham was too old, Jacob was a liar, Leah was ugly, Joseph was abused, Moses had a stuttering problem, Samson had long hair and was a womanizer, Rahab was a prostitute, Jeremiah was too young, David was an adulterer, not to mention a murderer, Elijah was suicidal, Isaiah preached naked, Jonah ran from God, Naomi was a widow, Job went bankrupt and lost his whole family, Andrew lived in the shadow of his big brother, Peter denied Jesus, Martha worried about everything, the Samaritan woman was divorced more than once, Mary Magdalene was demon-possessed, Zacchaeus was too small, Timothy had an ulcer, Paul was a Christian killer, and Lazarus was dead. And yet, God still used them. I'm going to invite the praise team to come up here and prepare for our closing song. And while they do that, I want to emphasize that a life apart from God is a life without hope. 
A life apart from Jesus is a life without hope. It's going through life with the expectation or without the expectation that what am I going to do after this? What am I going to do with my life? You see, we need Jesus at the center. Jesus needs to be that foundation. Brothers and sisters, I, I want to encourage all of you to bring Jesus from the sides where he's been for so long now and bring him right to the center where he's meant to be. Right at the center. I want to invite all of you to stand as we do this closing song.